Thank you guys for being here. Um, my name is Josie Duffy Rice. I'm the research director at the Fair Punishment Project and the co-director at the Accountable Justice Collaborative. Um, and I'm a former journalist and lawyer who focuses on prosecutors. Um, today we're gonna be talking about bail, fines and fees, and how the criminal justice system affects people who are poor um, or living in poverty. And I'm really excited to have this panel of amazing people here um, that I'm gonna let introduce themselves. Um, we have Mark Levin with Right on Crime. We have Phil Telfian, I got it right? Excellent. Yes, nice. Um, with Equal Justice Under the Law. We have Karen Martin, who's with John Jay. Criminal Justice, right? Okay. We have Thomas Harvey, who's the co-executive director of the Arch City Defenders. Um, and I'm gonna let each of them go through and tell you a little bit about themselves before we get started with the panel. Um, so why don't we start with you, Mark? Sure, well, uh, thanks so much for having me. Um, I've spoken at many Federal Society events and in fact was uh, president of the, that chapter at the University of Texas Law School and I remember when ACS started and I really think it's wonderful to have this exchange of ideas. And we, we uh, at the Texas Public Policy Foundation where I've been since 2005, I started our criminal justice program. I was just mentioning we have our annual policy orientation and we always try to have at least one non-conservative uh, or non-libertarian on the panel. Um, so, uh, but on this issue, I think as we're going to find out today, there's tremendous overlap uh, as far as across the ideological spectrum. But um, yeah, so I began this work back in 2005, which at that point, uh, for a free market think tank being involved in this issue uh, from the perspective of reducing incarceration um, and uh, improving outcomes really was uh, unique, frankly. And uh, then uh, in 2010, uh, came up with this idea for kind of building on what we had done in Texas nationally and started our Right on Crime initiative, um, which has grown uh, substantially. And we now have uh, state-based directors in various uh, states across the country, including Louisiana, where 10 criminal justice reform bills just passed that we're very proud of. Um, so uh, it's really exciting. You know, a lot of people, uh, I think particularly on the left, thought with this change in administration, um, particularly at the Department of Justice, that, that, that somehow uh, the efforts would lose momentum. And at least at the state level, um, we're uh, still seeing tremendous interest on the part of policymakers across the aisle uh, in this work. Um, it's certainly not easy uh, to uh, achieve reform, so that's uh, why all of us, I think, up here are doing the work we are. So um, I'm really looking forward to today's conversation. Oh, sorry. Um, so hello, everyone. I'm so glad to be here. Uh, as Josie mentioned, my name is Phil Telfian. I'm the executive director of Equal Justice Under Law. Uh, Equal Justice Under Law is a Washington, D.C.-based nonprofit that does civil rights and criminal justice reform litigation all across the country. Uh, we're actually a relatively new organization. I started it about three years ago. Um, before that, I was in the civil rights division of the Department of Justice from about uh, 2009 to 2014. Um, I love the name of this panel, The Price of Injustice, because it uh, is very closely related to the name of, of my organization, um, Equal Justice Under Laws. Well, as some of you may know, it's the um, slogan of the U.S. Supreme Court. And uh, before, uh, before founding the organization, I made sure there was no copyright violation, which there isn't. Um, but it's based on the idea that justice should be equal, and there should be no price tag on justice. Um, and so, so that informs a lot of the work we do. Um, we focus on things like debtors, uh, prison reform, when people are put in jail because they can't pay court costs, or when people have their licenses suspended because they can't pay court costs. Obviously, bail reform, which is uh, one of the topics I'll be talking more about today. And uh, sadly, as so many of you know, the whole justice system is in unequal. And it's uh, much better to be rich in the justice system than it is to be poor. And that's really the theme of the work we do. Uh, we, we don't believe that should be the case. Um, and so uh, our litigation is, is focused on, on bridging that gap. Hi, thanks for having me. I am Karen Martin from the John Jay College of Criminal Justice. And um, I'm a little bit different from other people on the panel. I'm a solid academic. So what I'm contributing is empirical research on this topic. I've been studying it for a while. My dissertation was on 
federal sentencing guidelines and the use of fines and restitution at the federal level. And since then, I've transitioned to doing state and local work. So I'm part of an uh, eight-state, five-year study where we are looking at a lot of qualitative and quantitative data, so doing court observations and interviewing people with debt, but also interviewing defense attorneys and prosecutors and judges and court staff to understand kind of the meaning that people make and what it means to them to use money in criminal justice. Um, we're also doing a lot of uh, quantitative analysis with like uh, automated court data. So my take on this in sum is that there are a lot of unanswered questions, one of them being the cost side. So there's obviously human costs with being, putting people in, incarcerating people if they can't pay, but also revoking probation and parole, uh, the debt issues that come into play with uh, bad credit and then what that does for your ability to move on with your life. And then the cost to the government. So there, at this point, is not any solid empirical evidence about what the actual cost of the system of fines, fees, court costs, or charges, restitution, bail is to the state. And policymakers, of course, care very much about what the cost side is. We policymakers think they're going to get revenue from assessing these things. They do get revenue. The question I ask is, is the revenue actually outweighing the cost? So my name is Thomas Harvey. I'm the co-founder and executive director of Arch City Defenders in St. Louis. And Arch City Defenders is a nonprofit civil rights law firm that provides holistic legal advocacy to the poor and indigent in the St. Louis region and beyond. We also have an impact litigation unit that brings civil rights challenges to debtors' prisons, cash bail, police misconduct. Uh, essentially, it's an outgrowth of the work that we've done on behalf of uh, poor folks and communities of color in St. Louis and any of the um, issues that they're facing with the legal system, if we can simultaneously represent them on their individual case and seeks to bring systemic challenges to those types of issues, we will bring that litigation. Um, we also use policy and media advocacy to um, raise these questions and keep them on the you know, front pages of the newspaper and in the press as much as we can so that uh, the rest of the lawyers and politicians don't forget about them. So. Great. Um, that was a great intro, and also most of you answered my first question, so we're so efficient <laughs> so far. Um, I was going to ask how each of your work relates to the um, issue of bail, fines and fees, probation costs, et cetera. I think we sort of covered that. Um, but I'd like to talk to you all about how, um, how things have changed in the past couple of years. I think everybody up here at least knows that people are talking about bail, fines and fees, um, and just basically the costs of being involved in the criminal justice system, especially when you're poor, much more now than they were two, three, four years ago. Um, and I'm wondering how that has, what you guys are seeing in your work day to day and how that has changed the response on the ground, both when you're talking about policymakers, when Phil, when you're talking about being in court, um, from an academic perspective, what are you, what, what has the kind of uh, trajectory been like in the past couple of years of trying to get this work, this process changed? Well, uh, what I'll say is I think that uh, the bail and the fines and fees are somewhat separate issues in terms of like the political challenges. Um, with the bail reform, and, and by the way, some of you may have seen there was a major ruling striking down Harris County, which is Houston's misdemeanor bail system, which was an abomination. 40% uh, of the people arrested on misdemeanors uh, could not get out of jail because they couldn't make bail. Um, and uh, indeed, the evidence showed the bail was intentionally set at higher than these people could afford. Um, so what, what you effectively have is almost no one gets sentenced to jail for misdemeanors. So the punishment is occurs before the adjudication rather than afterwards based on an ability to pay, um, which is a complete perversion of our Constitution and founding principles. Um, so, uh, but And then, of course, a, a major bail reform bill went into effect in New Jersey in January. They've almost eliminated cash bail, and in fact, uh, California, both chambers have preliminarily passed a, a very good bail reform bill. Um, so uh, it's gaining momentum, as is the work on fines and fees, uh, but the bail reform um, has tremendous opposition from bail bondsmen, uh, and they give substantially in state legislatures, which caused our bill in Texas not to make it. It did pass uh, the state Senate. Um, so they also give to judges, by the way, on the local level, and again, in states like Texas, where we elect judges in partisan elections. And indeed, those same judges, in many cases, significantly reduce or waive the forfeitures, which is supposed to be the whole free market argument for bail that they theoretically forfeit the money if the person doesn't show up, but actually they wiggle themselves out of it in, in vast majority of cases. Um, so, but the whole 
issue, I think, to begin with is one where um, what I find is a lot of conservative policymakers are confused because they think bail is a free market system, um, like I go into Walmart and buy a product. Um, but in the reality, you have to ask who's the customer, who's the consumer, and certainly not the person getting the bail bond. Um, of course, you also, before we had commercial bail, which started in the 1890s, uh, bail you know, would be set theoretically at an amount that the person could pay, but now it's 10% of whatever the amount because of the commercial bail system, and still many people can't, can't afford that. So the fines and fees issue, uh, and, 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 uh, and to contrast that, what we're up against politically is, um, in many cases, judges uh, who, part of their salaries, like in Louisiana, come from, it's an eat what you kill, the fines and fees, um, uh, clerks even, uh, Part of their funding comes in Louisiana from fines and fees. So, yeah, even public defenders in Louisiana, you're absolutely right. So, although I don't think they opposed, as far as I know, the legislation, but I just spoke at a conference of um, Louisiana judges and I got heckled uh, in discussing this topic. So, um, it it's uh, uh, and counties, of course, to some degree, uh, uh, have um, concerns about that. That part of their money comes from fines and fees. Prosecutors. So. Um, uh, we've created uh, a system where uh, the government is dependent on this, much like civil asset forfeiture. So there's a perverse incentive to continue this. And so, um, you know, ultimately what I would say is that um, I don't see anything wrong with someone who has the ability to pay, um, uh, paying, for example, a probation fee, but absolutely people should not be revoked uh, from probation, which you can in some jurisdictions because you're unable to pay a fee. And also, we need to move beyond the indigent standard to look at what impose substantial hardship. And our Texas Supreme Court and some legislation that's pending before Governor Abbott changes the uh, standard so that the question is, would it impose substantial financial hardship? So if I have $500 in my bank account and my rent's due in a few days, I'm not technically indigent, but the rent's $500. I can't pay a several hundred dollars to the court, and that person shouldn't, shouldn't be put in that position to choose between being homeless and paying their fee. So um, I want to follow up on a couple of the items Mark mentioned. Um, it's such a great question, uh, Josie, in terms of how things have changed. And it's been interesting for me um, at Equal Just Under Law, as I mentioned, we're just uh, three years old as an organization. And we filed our first uh, money bail challenge about two years ago in early 2015. Um, and we filed 12 challenges against money bail all across the country um, in nine different states. Uh, the first lawsuit we filed, I remember the call with opposing counsel, um, local, local attorney was very confused by the lawsuit, what could be unconstitutional about money bail. Um, it's, it's sort of like the fish in water. It, it had been such a common part of our pretrial justice system for so many decades and even centuries um, that I remember when we filed our first lawsuit, there was a lot of confusion, and that really that really had been true for quite a long time, um, a year, year and a half of, of doing this kind of work. And as I mentioned, you know, filing challenges in different parts of the country, West Coast, South, and Midwest, um, all over the place. Initially, there was some, well, money bail is such a deep, integral part of our system. And uh, we have a big uh, federal class action lawsuit in San Francisco, um, which is which has uh, partly spurred some of the legislation uh, in California that Mark just mentioned, and we're working with the with the legislators over there um, on on what hopefully will be good progress on money bail reform. But what's happening, or what I've seen over the past couple of years, is the idea, the con the fundamental concept of fairness, sort of sinking in for folks, um, particularly cities and counties, sort of sort of getting the idea of. I call it a price tag on freedom, and why that doesn't make sense. Why, when two people who are arrested for the exact same offense, maybe there's a bar fight, and they're both arrested for you know assault and battery, and, and told you can buy your way out for $10,000, the rich person does so, and, and the person who can't afford it stays in jail for weeks or months pending trial. Um, as many of you know, and, and Mark alluded to, for a lot of these offenses, there's not going to be a jail sentence at the end. And so really what's happening with money bail is that people who are poor are being coerced into pleading guilty because they know, wait, I've been sitting in jail for weeks. I'm missing my rent. My family's being evicted. I've already lost my job. Uh, you know, my children or grandparents are, aren't getting the care that I give to them, whatever it is, family situations, et cetera. And so, of course, in, even if you're innocent of the crime, you're, you're very likely to plead guilty just to get out of jail. And prosecutors have been using money bail to make that happen. And that is why bail is set in sort of intentionally high. Um, so there had been a lot of thinking, and I, I sort of want to connect up some of Mark's um, good points about uh, the fines and fees. I think our criminal justice system for so long has operated on an unspoken philosophy that it should be user-funded. 
that people who uh, break the law should pay for the system and the fines and fees should help support the system. Um, that there should be a free market component to our criminal justice system. So private bail companies should be integrally involved in helping people achieve justice, right? This is, this is sort of a capitalist mentality. Um, that had not really been spoken, and I think that underlying philosophy is more and more being exposed. And I think people understand how much money and profit are influencing so many decisions in the justice system and this notion of fairness, which is a subjective concept, and yet we, I think, almost universally come to agreement on it if we really think about it. Um, we've had judges across the political spectrum, liberals and conservatives, when forced to ask the fairness question, come down and say, yeah, it doesn't seem fair that two people with the exact same criminal history, the exact same charge, the exact same low risk of flight and low risk of danger uh, should have different outcomes just because one can afford the price tag on freedom and the other can't. That fairness question is starting to make, um, is starting to rise to people's consciousness, uh, which I like. And then this fundamental question of what is the justice system for? Why do we have it? Is it just, uh, I think the way it's been operating is a, it's a method of processing human beings, right? Well, we have so many arrests, Policing happens in largely poor communities, and so we've got so many folks who are poor getting arrested, and there's too many of them to go to trial each time, so how do we coerce guilty pleas? Well, let's keep them in jail. Well, how do we get them in jail when there's a presumption of innocence? Let's set bail amounts artificially high so most people who are arrested can't actually afford to get out. That's the whole system of processing human beings to coerce guilty pleas to get the processing moving. And hopefully, I hope most of the folks in this room, and I hope most of the folks in the country think that our justice system is for something else. Uh, the obvious answer is in the name. Hopefully it's for justice. <laughs> it's for uh, you know, get, getting fair results for people. And I think some of those ideas, so to get back to Josie's question in terms of the change that I've seen, are starting to resonate with more and more folks. And so I'm really excited to see that. I would like to put an even finer point on some of the great points that have been brought up. One is that we are at a point where about 70% of the people in jail right now are pre-trial, right? So the, innocent until proven guilty, 70% of our o many overcrowded jails are pre-adjudication, um, which I think we should all ponder for a moment. Uh, there's the pay only probation, unsupervised supervision that exists, so again, unsupervised supervision, is when people are on probation and all they're doing is paying a probation fee. That's the sum total of their supervision is paying probation department. In Texas and other places, up to half of the probation department's budget comes from <laughs> probation fees. Around the state, the uh, states are becoming dependent, but different agents are, are becoming dependent on these fines and fees and have been for a while. So if you look across the country, if you actually look at the statutes and see where these fines and fees and surcharges are going, you find they're going to things like transportation, building roads, of course doing things like building prisons, but also salaries of everybody, including DAs. Um, I, there was one, I think, in Mississippi that was for uh, school for deaf children, um, uh, elections, clean elections in Arizona, there's a surcharge that goes to that. So you really like dig into where the legislatures have decided this money should be used. It's funding mm -hmm. all across, you know, every aspect of government. Um, and, you know, I think that's a problem. <laughs> And I would say that, you know, you're saying that there's this underlying philosophy that uh, we are essentially treating this as user fees. I would say it's, it's even broader than that. This anybody who comes into contact with the criminal justice system, again, before any assessment of guilt or conviction, you know, something as simple as a driving ticket, you get the driving ticket, but you also get these surcharges on top of it. And sometimes these fines and surcharges and fees incur even if you end up fighting the ticket and winning. So you've already, there's some outlay of cash that the state is getting, regardless of your guilt, right? So I think it's just any contact with the criminal justice system is going to cost you. And this issue of fairness, I would agree. I'm, I'm also heartened to see that it's actually be, you know, becoming part of the public discourse and certainly amongst policymakers. And one of the things that I think that, it, you know, we kind of touched on this a little bit is that this idea that the same person with the same crime should have the same punishment. Well, Europe solved this decades ago with something called a day fine, right? Where it, the day fine is a literal, you know, multiplication of the severity of the offense and the person's net daily income or some other assessment of how much money they have. They multiply those together, and that determines your fine. And in Germany, it's something like 80% of their offenses are are uh, punished with day fines. And all over Scandinavia, Western Europe, and I, I believe some places in South America. So this is not a revolutionary idea. It's very well documented to be very effective. I think we would have to tailor it a little bit for the US context for both political climate reasons and that we have an adversarial justice system and other places don't. We can't compel, for example, release of tax, um, tax uh, release of ta tax, 
return. Text. That's it. That's, uh. that's the R word. Um, so given that, I think we'd have to tail it a little bit for the US context, but I think that there could be a lot of traction there. So I, I'm, not as, I'm not as optimistic about the changes that I've seen, and part of that's because of the work that we've done in Ferguson and in St. Louis. And, and just to give you a context, think about after Mike Brown was murdered in 2014, and effectively the eyes, the journalism eyes of the entire world were focused on St. Louis and Ferguson. We had the Department of Justice come in and conduct an inquiry into the police misconduct and eventually expanded that work into the courts. Um, we, for more than a year, there were hundreds, maybe thousands of heroic protesters who were on the streets every night, literally putting their bodies on the lines to keep attention focused on the systemic abuses of our legal system, whether it be the police department and the killing of unarmed black men in America or the systemic aspects of our court system. And what we got after that year after that Department of Justice investigation, which was fantastic, they did great work on that. After the report, after they actually sued Ferguson briefly before they agreed to the consent decree, what, think about what the outcome of that was. We got courts to agree to be open to the public. We got courts to stop charging illegal fines that were not authorized under state statute. We got courts to allow defendants to raise the question of indigency at a hearing, which is already part of the law, part of state law, part of local law. Uh, we had briefly a Senate bill that capped revenue in St. Louis County at 12.5%, subsequently um, was raised to 20% for a variety of reasons, but we, we agreed that courts should only profit 20% of their overall income, uh, overall revenue of the courts, uh, of, the, of the municipality. And then also, Remember, Ferguson is one of 90 cities in St. Louis County. So there are 21 or 22,000 people who live there. You cannot make a meaningful difference in people's lives by changing the policies of one city among 90 mm -hmm. and then pretend that you fix things. And so I don't, I don't put much stock in the changes that we've seen. I think rhetorically people are talking about fairness, but and I will tie this back to our, the plenary we had. What does fairness mean in America? What does justice mean in America? Our societal norms have always allowed for the mass jailing of poor people and black people in America. I think one could reasonably argue that that's the purpose of our legal system. If you just measure the outcomes of this legal system and, and you say we measure systems by the results, that is the purpose of our legal system. That is our societal norm. So in a way, what we've seen is we didn't see transgressions of our societal norms or our judicial norms in Ferguson and in Harris County and across, across the country. We see what our legal system is. And what we're now getting is some more tacit agreement that it shouldn't have been that way. And new laws that essentially say, follow the old laws. Stop doing these bad things. And this time we're gonna be serious. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And it's mostly a failure of lawyers and the legal system as well as politicians and, and people um, across the board. And one of the major failures, I, I think, and I'll stop on this, is just that um, a refusal to identify race as the central motivating factor for this and an analysis, that's an analysis that is limited to or mostly focused on cost, benefit. Um, I think we all know in this country that uh, the system has always found a way to incarcerate, to lock up, to jail, to exploit poor people and black people, regardless of what the costs were. And if we only focus on the costs, I think in many of these places, the benefit of social control and exclusion outweighs the financial costs. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's something that we have to continue to keep at the forefront of what we're talking about. So that is perfect because I was gonna bring up um, both to Karen and Thomas to talk about the, I mean, it's not perfect, it's terrible. I didn't mean like, <laughs> <laughs> I realize that following what you just said, that is perfect, is not. Um, but um, I was gonna ask you, Thomas, to talk more about Ferguson, and I'm glad that you, um, you brought it up because I think what we did see in Ferguson is just how, which echoes throughout the criminal justice system, of course, um, but the, um, the injustice 
uh, multiplied when we talk about people of color and especially black people and the experience that they have in the criminal justice system. So Karen, I know that a lot of your academic work has also dealt with race as it relates to these things. And I was wondering what, um, so what you found, I mean, I know you found a lot, but like what, what, <laughs> what um, because these systems end up making people who are, who, are, um, who are disadvantaged in these systems pay more to begin that disadvantaged system. And I'm wondering sort of what your research has showed um, now that Thomas has kind of talked about his experience in Ferguson. Okay, so I, I would just, I would quickly say that one of the, and I won't go into the numbers, I'll leave that for the researcher on the panel, but I, I would say that um, broadly speaking, one of the things that we have seen that's been received as a, sub, a substantial change is the availability of community service mm -hmm. to convert fines to community service. If you look at the way these fines are converted, they're converted at an hourly rate. So value a person's community service at $10 an hour. And then, and this makes some sense, right? If you look at this on the surface level, you say you owe it $800. We recognize you can't pay it, you're poor, we're so fair and just, we will allow you to go do community service valued at $10 an hour, and that will work off your debt to us. And, it, and, then, and the problem with, I think, lawyers and the legal system in general is we start at that point, which is assuming that the initial contact with the legal system was mm -hmm. legitimate. Mm -hmm. And for so many of our clients, they're being racially profiled, and their, their mere presence in that courtroom is a result of their race, or their poverty. And so then if you think about what community service is, it's still, the fines are an attempt to punish and, and to recognize we believe you've broken this law, um, but we don't think it's serious enough that you should go to jail and we wanna stop that. And so now what we're gonna do is let you do community service. But if the idea is to bring about compliance with the law, so your law is a driving while suspended or a no proof of insurance or failure to register your vehicle, these are not people who are just openly flouting the law, who have the, the money uh, available to get their license reinstated, to pay for, to pay $300 a month for insurance after you've been in front of these courts for the last 20 years of your life, to get your vehicle registered, which means paying the full amount of your say, the, um, property taxes, which can sometimes be three times the value of your vehicle in St. Louis County. These are, these are people who, no matter what punishment you assess, be it fines, jail, hundreds of hours of community service, will never be able to comply with the law that they've been accused of violating because they are impoverished. Mm -hmm. And at some point, that, that's why I don't put a whole lot of value in that change because we still fail to recognize, and we're gonna just have to accept it at some point, there are some people who you, for whom the le contact with the legal system will never bring about compliance. Not because they don't want to, but because our societal structure has failed them so badly that they can never come into compliance when compliance is money. And if, if you have a, we represent, we have more than 1,000 open cases right now representing mostly homeless folks or people who are preventing homelessness or people who are transitioning out of homelessness. And the most absurd moment is when you go to court and they say, obviously now that you've brought you know, lawsuits against 30 cities in this region, we don't want jail time and we don't want money, but we want this single mother with three children who is residing in a homeless shelter to go do community service to pay off her debt to us. And you have to pause and say, where would you like her to do the community service? Well, how about at a homeless shelter? <laughs> oh, that's a fantastic idea. Where do you propose she find childcare for her three children while she's doing the community service? And should she stop working her two jobs that she's working even though she's in a shelter to go do the community service? It's still absurd, right? We're still punishing these folks and we can call it community service, but that has not changed. And even more dangerously, the availability of community service is now being touted as a sign of our generosity and our fairness. Mm -hmm. And it does not address the fundamental principle. And, and we, I hope we at some point get to talk about risk assessments, which is gonna mm -hmm. likely replace cash bail and may in fact reproduce the same results that have brought so many people in contact with the criminal legal system. Yes, well said. I was going to make similar points about community service and how 
it is, if you're disadvantaged in paying a fine, you have the same disadvantages for community service. Um, the issue of race is so broad and deep that it, it's a little flummoxing to try to sum it up with some research. But I, will, I wanted to paint you a broad picture and then give you a, a detailed uh, result. So the broad picture is, I'm sure you uh, know about mass incarceration, but I think it's good to have some numbers around that. So to compare across uh, countries, we use the rate per 100,000 people. So the international rate per 100,000 people of incarceration is about 150, 200 per 100,000. And there are some wiggle room in terms of how you count this. If you look at the United States, the rate per 100,000 of incarcerating white men is about three to 400-ish. If you look at that rate for Latinos in America, any guesses? 500. 800-ish per 100,000. If you look at the rate for African American men, I know, any guesses? <coughs> what? Yep, about 21 to 2,200 per 100,000 people in the United States. That's disturbing. The, uh, there's research that shows that a black man has a one in three chance of going to prison, right? Um, the statistics are very troubling and they filter down to the most micro, so I just spent a week observing court. <laughs> I will, the place will remain nameless, but if you have never done that, just to observe court without being a professional in the court, just go sit in court and watch, especially at a city court, municipal level, just watch. So I did it for four days, every single day, most of the courtrooms I went into, which was at least a dozen, every single person in the gallery was a person of color, about 95% African American, and every single person who was working there, the DAs, the defendant, the defense attorneys, the probation officers, the judge, the court security, the court clerks, were Caucasian over and over and over again. 100% racial divide. And so just seeing that as an observer I think is important for everybody. Like I teach college and I make my students go observe court because I think as Americans you just don't know that. And I think it's important to get that visual. Um, the one study that I'll talk about very briefly and I'll spare you the kind of gory details, but uh, uh, we did a study on the death penalty. It's a psychological study with um, internet based so we got people from around the country and what we were trying to figure out is the effect of the death penalty being an option on conviction rate, right? So that's not the direction it's supposed to work in, but lo and behold, that's the direction it works. So if people knew that the death penalty was an option, they became more likely to convict a black, de black defendant. They became less likely to convict a white defendant if they knew the death penalty was an option, right? So that is how we determine guilt, unfortunately, in this country, at least in our sample. Um, I have plenty else to say, but I'll save it for questions if it comes up later. Yeah, please follow up. Or oh, okay, I have great. Some more questions. Well, um, yeah, the, uh, I wanted to just address a couple things. Um, I totally agree with the issue of, I'm glad the driver's license suspensions was brought up. In Virginia, a million people have their driver's license suspended. Um, so, and it's an automatic system. There was a slight change this past session, but it, it's still uh, uh, terrible. Um, the, one of the issues that comes up, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the risk assessment question because um, uh, that is what, of course, New Jersey and Kentucky, the places that don't have commercial bail, and I think the results are pretty promising in both places. You look in, in uh, New Jersey, pre uh, only a third of the people who were detained previously, the third of the total, um, so we've seen a two-thirds reduction in pretrial detention, and uh, like five or ten cases have money bail set since the New Jersey law went into effect in January. I mean, um, one of the issues that does come up is that uh, uh, in Texas, for example, the state constitution says the only uh, reason you can be denied bail is capital murder, not even regular murder. So uh, some states, and New Jersey was one in New Mexico, when they did bail reform, they also uh, expanded their constitutional provision about who could be uh, detained or denied bail pretrial, preventive detention. Um, and, you know, I think this is a, it's a very difficult issue, but I think ultimately, um, uh, certainly from my perspective, certainly there are people that are so dangerous that they do need to be detained. And, of course, the way the money bail system deals with it is someone like Robert Durst, who dismembered people, he bail set at millions of dollars. Well, he was able to come up with 10% of that and continue uh, his atrocious conduct. So um, I, I really think we, 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 we have to uh, do allow for some... Uh, form of preventive detention uh, accompanying the fact that we're eliminating cash bail. Um, and I think that the risk assessment, I mean, you absolutely need proper training on it. You absolutely need to make sure you don't count arrests. 
um, and you don't count prior drug possession. And if you do those things, I think you can eliminate uh, the kind of unwarranted racial disparities. Uh, because you know, you look at like a violent crime or a property crime where there's a victim, you know, that there's not the room for racial disparity that there is for arresting people for drugs, which really depends a lot on, you know, we know all the races use drugs in the same amount, so a lot of it depends on whether you're able to get drugs surreptitiously, what neighborhood you live in, and all of that. So that all can be adjusted for in the in the risk and needs assessment. So it has to be done properly, um, but I think that is the solution, because we can't just have no um, uh, standard for whether, and again, the vast majority of people should be released prior to trial. It's only those who pose an extreme danger, a very small percentage that should be detained. Uh, one other issue that uh, that I want to touch on, the community service aspect. Um, it is, a, uh, I think that there is, community service is a step forward, but I do agree. I mean, we had a case in Texas where a guy was on probation and a wheelchair, and the judge said you had to do 300 hours of community service. I mean, it's ludicrous. Um, but, um, you know, if you can find someone, you can have community service, then a lot of people on the right are going to say, well, where's the accountability at all. Now, some of these things that shouldn't even be criminal offenses to begin with, like a broken taillight, we ought to be converting a lot of these things to at most civil violation, give someone a warning, show that you replaced your taillight or you don't have money to, and that should be the end of it. Um, but I'm talking about, you know, for things that really should be against the law, which, you know, again, a lot of these uh, things, uh, when we had someone in Ferguson who had an uh, outstanding warrant for an overgrown lawn, someone in Baytown, Texas, was arrested for an overdue library book. So we need to be decriminalized a lot of this conduct to begin with, and I think that will also help us. You know, it's funny. I've been doing this work a long time, and I still hear stories where I'm like, that yeah, is yeah. actually insane. I did yeah. not know that we arrested people for yeah, library yeah. books. That's a new one. Um, so let's talk about risk assessments for a minute, sure. because I actually, um, I, I am wary of risk assessments personally. I think that, um, I think there's no good there's no perfect way to do this, but risk assessments also lend themselves to racial bias and class bias and, um, and, and inordinately hurt people who don't have a permanent address or can't keep a cell phone number or um, uh, maybe are just assessed as less likely to show up to their court hearing because they ha don't have the stability that other people have. So I'm gonna ask Thomas and Karen again and Phil because you guys have sort of done this work and. Um, talked about uh, risk assessments and know what's happening in New Jersey to sort of talk about the pluses and minuses more and what goals, what solutions you see to this bail system. I mean, I think that what we're getting at is that there's, you can't reform the bail system without reforming the entire system. And that what we're, the, the, um, the or you can, but you're, you're not gonna get the perfect solution. You're still gonna be faced with a lot of the same problems. But in terms of the work that is happening in Ferguson and academia and court, in state legislatures, what are what what do you suggest if not risk assessments, and what are the problems you see with that? I think I'd, I'd want to jump in and, and sort of piggyback on some of the great points Thomas made. Um, I sadly agree with I think what was his pessimistic assessment that risk assessment seems like the likely replacement for cash bail, um, and I think part of the reason is built into both the point Thomas made and the question you asked, Josie, which is that risk assessments are very likely to discriminate based on race and class, and unfortunately, that inequity probably increases the likelihood that that will be exactly the tool of choice, because it's mm -hmm. consistent with how the whole criminal justice system has functioned for so many uh, hundreds of years, and so it's, it, it has exactly the features that our system is, is ready, willing, and able to accept a co total disparity based on race and class. Um, I personally am against it. doesn't feel like a solution to me. Um, uh, like Mark alluded to, I'm very motivated by what I learned in my first year of law school, which was that our Constitution <coughs> protects a presumption of innocence, that you're not innocent, uh, you're not considered guilty in this country until you're convicted by a jury of your peers beyond a reasonable doubt. That really stuck with me. It was sort of a proud moment for me as a, as a young student learning this, this really grand, noble ideal. Um, and knowing the Spoiler history. Spoiler alert. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, no, knowing the history of where it came from and, and the notion of, of people being arrested and presumed guilty and detained. Um, and then, of course, like Karen was talking about, you have any experience, either personal experience or a relative or a friend through the criminal justice system, or you just sit in court watch and you realize it's exactly the opposite that we have a system that's designed to keep people detained. Um, so for me, this all gets to a, a more fundamental question. Of course, our system shouldn't be unequal based on race and class. I, I, 
I hope there's no one in this room who has any hesitation over that basic principle. But the deeper question is, should people be locked up pre-trial? Mark brings up a good example of, of, of the uh, you know, extreme serial killers who, you know, if they're released pre-trial, they may commit more horrendous crimes. And um, as, as moving as that is, and um, I don't like horrendous crimes, I think, I think that's another topic we can all come to agreement on. Um, I, I do at the same time, I do at the same time without, without trying to be insensitive, think we do have to accept some level of risk in our society. Mm -hmm. We've chosen as a free society not to do what happened in the Tom Cruise movie Minority Report, where just because we, we have a crystal ball, and we don't have a crystal ball, but even if we had a crystal ball, right, even if we thought we knew who was likely to commit a future serious crime, can we lock that person up? In my mind, the answer is no. And it's the question of, of freedom versus security, right? It's the question of safety versus freedom. Do, how do we weigh that balance? And, and it's, a, it's a very philosophical, value-based judgment. For me, there are risks in our society. Probably everyone in this room has some small risk, or maybe for some of you, large risk, of committing some crime, be it victimless or maybe a serious crime, right? Does that mean you can be locked up right now? Probably not, right? Now the philosophy of our justice system is once the state has its hands on you, once you've committed some other innocuous offense, like your taillights out, then we get to do this risk assessment and realize, oh wow, you're also a, a risk for some other future crime. Just like many of the folks in this room might be, but the state doesn't have its hands on you yet. Um, and the risk assessment philosophy is based on we can detain people because we have the crystal ball. So I guess my thinking is, A, the crystal ball is probably wrong. It's going to have all those inequities that Josie pointed out. But also, I'm not so sure what to do with it. Um, just because I know someone is likely to commit a future crime, does that mean I lock them up? My instinct, I'm not a parent, but if I had kids and I felt like I knew they were about to get into trouble, would be to help steer them on the right course. I wouldn't want to put them in jail where they're, after just three days in jail, their recidivism rate is likely to increase. I'd want to give them the tools they need to really ex succeed in our society. And so a risk assessment philosophy is best made, based much more on this punitive model as opposed to this rehabilitative model. And so um, it's heavily flawed, I think. I don't know, I don't want to put words in Thomas' mouth, but I was inspired by what he said, and I feel like it's fundamentally flawed. And I, I hope we go a different direction. I have just a brief comment on this. I think it's important to remember what the point of bail is, which is to get somebody to come back to court. Plain and simple, that is all it is. It's an encouragement, incentive to come back to court. So given that premise, there is a wide world that we can explore, that places have started to explore, with like text message reminders or even GPS monitoring, you know, check-ins, reporting, day reporting centers. There's a whole bunch of things we can do besides insisting that somebody give you money. If the point is that they come back to court, again, we're presuming innocence. Um, and I I think that um, I would be interested in exploring that more empirically and doing testing, of course, because I'm an empiric, I'm a researcher. Yeah, I would, I would say that I think some of the proposed risk assessment models might make sense. I, I think they're flawed and they could be flawed in all the ways that Phil mentioned and I think that are obvious. If you start saying, what's your address? What's your cell phone? What's your employment? Have you ever been arrested before? Have you failed to, failed to appear in court before? Um, these are all things that are going to disproportionately impact our clients, especially the folks that we represent who are experiencing homelessness, and it doesn't have anything to do with whether or not they're dangerous. It's just there's a legal system that existed before the moment we decided we would have a pretrial risk assessment regime, and I don't know how you could ever account for those past, you know, 100 years of contact with the legal system in your new tool. So I, I don't know how that would work. I'm not sure what the, the philosophy is. I would also say that I want to point out one sort of interesting dynamic about the issue of cash bail and risk assessment. Um, we, we did almost all of our work around folks who are experiencing homelessness, but then when, when Mike Brown was murdered, we began representing protesters who were arrested for exercising their First Amendment, illegally arrested for um, exercising their First Amendment rights in Ferguson, and they, I think they knew there, they went there knowing they may be jailed at some point, but they didn't expect a weeks long period of detention as was the case for some folks who were ostensibly released by Ferguson but then taken to other um, cities because they had outstanding warrants for unpaid fines and fees. Imagine in, in 2017 or 2018, um, Donald Trump does something predictably outrageous and people go to the streets to protest and people are arrested and there's a pretrial risk assessment in place that's being 
used to determine whether or not a protester is at risk of reoffense. In that scenario, I will always want cash bail <laughs> so that I can get my client out because otherwise I have to have my client say, I won't go back to the front lines. And I think we're miss, I, I don't know, I'm not familiar with all of the analysis of pretrial risk assessments and the elimination of cash bail, but in that context, and that's one I hold very dear, those, those folks made a monumental change. Um, the only reason we're talking about this, I would tell you, is because Mike Brown was murdered and people went on the streets for a year. Um, but if we take away cash bail in those instances, we don't have that movement. Mm -hmm. Those folks are just sitting in jail unless they swear they're never gonna go back out again and then it's a violation of their pretrial. You know, so I think we really need to think about that as we develop these um, policies. Yep, no, that's a great point and I think that the uh, risk assessment uh, should and, and some do, the focus ought to be on the, obviously the risk of a very serious violent and of course, either what the person was arrested for or a prior offense should have to be a very serious violent offense in order for the preventive detention certainly to uh, to apply. Um, so, uh, you know, yeah, the idea that you would have somebody arrested for a minor uh, for marijuana, but then say they're, you know, we think they're a high risk for violence, even though they've never had a violent offense before, I think would be uh, preposterous. But you're absolutely right that we have to guard against that and look very carefully uh, at these assessments before they're implemented. Well, I, I guess I want to just push back a little more, Mark, on the preventive detention philosophy, yeah. just get more of your thoughts on it. I mean, I, I would propose that the same standard be applied for someone who's been arrested versus someone who hasn't. So if the government has X level of information that you're likely to commit a serious crime, what is the burden in detaining you before you've been convicted? To me, the fact that you've been picked up for protesting, like Thomas mentions, or some taillight being out, or some innocuous offense, that doesn't seem like the right um, initial cause to bring you under the, the form of risk assessment. So my question is, absent any crime at all, if the government thought it had evidence through spying or other means that you were likely to commit a future crime, under what circumstances could it detain you? I would wonder what you think about that. And then why shouldn't that same, hopefully, very, very high standard apply to someone who's been picked up for some innocuous misdemeanor? Well, that's a great point. And of course, the, the closest analogy would be civil commitment for people that are mentally ill, that are, right. you know, an immediate danger to themselves or others. Um, so I think, first of all, I agree the underlying reason why they ha are arrested should have to be something that's a serious, violent offense. But I would also add that another safeguard would be to say that probable cause isn't enough, that there has to be clear and convincing evidence if, you know, maybe not beyond a reasonable doubt, but a clear and convincing that they're actually, um, you know, uh, of that offense for which they were arrested. So, um, you know, that ought to be uh, some additional safeguard um, on it. So you don't, because you can, you know, a lot of people arrested are innocent, uh, which is another issue. Um, so, yeah, I think that, that that would help to some degree. Um, but I just don't see how we could sell the public on something where, you know, there's not a single person who ever is released from jail, I mean, whoever, whoever can be kept uh, in jail pre-trial because, I mean, there are, it's a very small number, I think three to five percent who do, uh, you know, who committed very, allegedly committed very serious crimes and, and uh, you let a few people like that out and they do something like that again, you can start to unravel the whole reforms from a political perspective. So Phil, what's your answer to that? Well, I guess I'm just <laughs> still struggling because I, I appreciate that a yeah. lot. I think there are some safeguards in there, but I wonder if, if your philosophy would apply to someone who, who hasn't had any contact with the criminal justice system. There's just some, first of all, evidence that they're, they're likely to commit a future offense. And how would you feel if the same risk assessment philosophy was applied to someone who had yet to be arrested for anything? There's just future evidence. Well, I think that'd be unconstitutional, yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, so then yeah. why does the arrest kick it off? Why does that make it fair? Well, I mean, if again, if, if, if you're arrested for something that's, you know, a serious offense and there's clear and convincing evidence that you did that, I mean, you can't put people on, you can't conduct a trial overnight. I mean, it takes, to, to have a trial uh, on something could take months. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I, I guess I would say that, uh, um, that, that there, now, you could also say, by the way, that the preventive detention really ought not be in a jail since somebody hasn't convicted. It should be in another, you know, uh, type of 
facility that's, uh, I actually toured the prisons of Germany and they have preventive detention on the back end and there's a separate, uh, it's in like an apartment complex and the prisons are comparable to our college dormitories. There's a 60 Minutes episode I recommend on this, but the, the uh, preventive detention, and they use it very sparingly, um, but it's comparable to what we have for sex offenders, civil commitment, but of course we just rename prisons and call it civil commitment. But they, it's an apartment complex literally on the grounds of the prison, which would look like any normal apartment complex. I mean, I'm not trivializing it because you're still taking away somebody's liberty um, and there are serious constitutional issues, I think, with, with, with this. There, there has to be a way for someone to get out of it. That's essentially what the U.S. courts have said uh, with respect to preventive detention on the back end uh, in this country, which is typically for sex offenders. Um, and in some states, you see almost no one ever gets out. And so mm -hmm. you're like, if this is for, for a medical purpose, supposedly, there ought to be a evidence that you can actually eventually get out of it. But yeah, on the pretrial thing, it has to be very closely circumscribed. I totally agree with it. But certainly there are people, you know, someone who has a record of... Uh, you know, previous conviction for, for a very serious violent crimes and now is arrested for murder. I don't see how you could just turn them out. I think what Mark is hitting on, which is correct, is that the public, uh, to use your phrase, generally feels worse when a serious crime has been committed by someone who was sort of on pretrial release than the exact same serious crime committed by, by someone who wasn't on pretrial release. And I think what I'm realizing as I hear you talk is I don't have that feeling. If there's a horrible, you know, child kidnapping or, or rape or murder, it, it, it's a tragedy in my mind. And it doesn't make it worse that the sort of the state had its hands on the person. I remember after the um, World Trade Center attacks, there was a, some news story that one of the 9-11 hijackers had gotten a speeding ticket like five days before. And this was supposed to sort of matter to people. And I was like, what does that mean? Were we supposed to detain him because he, he was speeding? Like the implication of that just didn't, didn't really do anything for me. But I think for a lot of people it does. It's like, wow, we caught him for speeding five days before this horrible event. If only we had locked him up. I just don't have that mentality. So for me, uh, the, the, whatever the standard is, you mentioned unconstitutionality, whatever our philosophy is for detaining someone who has yet to commit a crime that we think they may commit in the future, for me it should be the same. Because I don't, I, don't I don't put that much weight on an arrest because of a lot of Thomas's points, knowing how policing works, knowing what we've decided to criminalize in our country, and the rest just carries very little weight for me. But I agree it's a turning point for a lot of the public. I would add that um, once you are arrested and sort of involved in the system, it might increase your chances of committing crimes later. Um, so I think, um, well, I'll, we'll say that that was a much more interesting conversation than what I had in law school. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and I wanted, I had a few more questions, but I actually see people in the audience who keep doing this. So <laughs> I'm wondering, would you, do you want to come up or do you want to speak from there? Uh, come up. Uh, I, you, you can't have a conversation about money bail without talking about the Arnold Foundation. Uh, and nobody said anything about that. So uh, I, I, I'd like to hear from Karen, who certainly knows a great deal about it because we're not having the same uh, debate about this that we had in 1973. And we, we haven't had money bail in the District of Columbia for 40 years. We haven't heard that in this conversation. So this has not been a full conversation of these issues about money bail. So could you talk about that? <laughs> <laughs> it would take hours to have a full. No pressure. Um, the Arnold Foundation is very, very, very active in the criminal justice space. If you know any researchers doing anything in criminal justice reform, most likely they are either currently receiving funding or <laughs> they uh, know somebody who is. And so that is absolutely true. And it's important to acknowledge Arnold because they have uh, funded and done research specifically on this pre-trial assessment, uh, this risk assessment, and they are quite confident they've cracked the code of the three factors, I think it's like three to five factors, and that's all you need to know in order to determine somebody's pre-trial risk. And what's important about that is it's a very powerful foundation, politically connected, funding lots of people, and so the chance for this to really take off across the country is quite large. Um, so I don't know if there's anything else you want me to acknowledge, yeah, well, but I mean, the, the research, <laughs> yes. they looked at 150,000 files yes. coming up to the algorithm. There, there is a track record mm -hmm. in 30 jurisdictions now, some of them state, some of them local. Somebody mentioned New Jersey in there, which, which has a positive result. Again, we need to have a three-dimensional discussion about this. 
Well, I would also, one of the dimensions is that there's still plenty of resistance against risk assessment amongst judges and probation parole mm -hmm. officers. Like there, it is not, just because there's a lot of momentum doesn't mean that the court system actors are all on board because obviously it's taking away their discretion. And one, you know, we're already in an era where discretion is being very much shifted to prosecutors. So anybody, any non-prosecutor is going to be very resistant to even more reduction of their discretion. Let me, let me just add, there's a big difference between, I think there's virtual consensus that it makes sense to use a risk and needs assessment when, in terms of setting somebody's supervision level once they're on probation or parole. Um, and of course, uh, prisons and other institutions use them as well to determine, and the needs part we really haven't focused on, but that's critical because if you address the needs, even if someone's medium or high risk, if the needs such as mental health treatment are addressed, you can actually really dramatically reduce the risk. So that's why the training is important is people, just because somebody's not low risk doesn't mean they need to be in, in locked up. Um, so that's very true. And we actually passed a bill in Texas this session to say that the courts uh, must consider when placing someone on probation, the risk and needs assessment and the not imposed conditions that go beyond uh, what the, because the problem is in a lot of places, almost everyone on probation gets 60 standard conditions, including not drinking alcohol, even if you know they're on probation for shoplifting, they don't have an alcohol problem. So uh, moving from a cookie cutter uh, system to more of one that's tailored individually, just like you see in education, is a real, uh, uh, trend that I think we do need to follow. Can, Can I, we I, identify what those um, risk factors are that the Arnold Foundation has? Or not, not their really website's got their, yeah. their one of their risk assessments available, and, and yeah. I, I don't I don't want to be misinterpreted as poo pooing the idea of a risk assessment. What I'm I think what I'm interested in is the way that the danger of some of those risk assessments is not universally agreed upon. Although the Arnold Foundation has established a lot of research that I think leads towards embracing their risk assessment. Um, but also, I think even in the New Jersey study, I believe some of it indicates that judges are departing downward from the risk assessment outcome, and that still speaks to the importance of having the individual actor, one judge, who can agree or disagree with the risk assessment. Um, and it sounds like in that case, maybe it's too early to tell because it was implemented in January, right? And so we're only in June now. So how do we, that isn't a long enough period of time to really measure successfully what the outcomes are going to be long term. Plus, if I know from St. Louis, there's a monstrous difference between judges. And in, we can have a history of judges um, imposing cash bail and keeping people detained pretrial with no policy change in the circuit. If you get a new judge in there, it shifts dramatically. Everyone is released on their own recognizance. It's not a product of a risk assessment. It's a product of that individual judge. And so, but, but more broadly speaking, I think the risk assessment might reproduce these things, but forget about that for a second. We have to fundamentally address why these folks are coming into contact with the legal system to begin with. Mm -hmm. A risk assessment still assumes that you were brought there to court and detained for legitimate, right. valid purposes, right. and I don't think there's a lot of reason to believe that's true based on our representation of homeless folks in St. Yeah. Louis, at least. I mean, I mean I, uh, I'm a judge in Wisconsin, and we used to uh, pre bail the bail risk assessment. And the bail risk assessment, I think, you know, I just went through a whole uh, CLE, as we all do, uh, of judges uh, talking about this risk assessment. And I think uh, th there is a lot more open-mindedness to uh, utilizing it as the cases come through. I agree with you that there's disparate, uh, you know, every judge is independent, and every judge, at least in Wisconsin, is independently elected. I, I also believe that, just like anybody else, judges are rational. And, um, and I think that there is, uh, I, I don't think it's either or. I think you're right. Why are these people coming into contact with the justice system? That's a question that needs to be answered. Yes, uh, you know, you, we should assume liberty at every turn. But number three, there's this, this sort of uh, understanding that incrementally this has to occur at the judicial, judicial level, because you may all agree, but ultimately it is the judge imposing that bail. And I think the risk assessment plays in a very important, fa a very important factor mm -hmm. in make, making sure that that, that increment uh, succeeds, that is, that everybody starts thinking about it in, in at least the terms that have been found to be, you know, objective. Mm -hmm. You can comment. Yeah. I would rather give people up. Yeah, 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 yeah ask the questions, but yeah, I could come yeah. back, yeah. 
So I have a couple of questions. I clerked in Minnesota for a judge with the felony docket for three years, and like the Wisconsin judge mentioned, we had a bail assessment form and we used that, and I didn't know there were other options. Um, we talked about DC a little bit, New Jersey, California. Can you tell me what those <laughs> other options are? And um, to besides cash bail, if you want to completely, whether you would have cash bail as a possibility or if there's other alternatives that ignores that, op that option completely. Um, and then I also wanted to ask about things that I see now as an assistant attorney general. I see a lot of forfeitures, a huge fines. Sometimes we'll have like a single mother with a few children, DWI, alcoholic, um, her car is forfeited, and then she gets huge fines, $683 just for one type of mm -hmm. court fee, not including all others, and the total is over $1,000. And I wanted you to speak a little bit to that. What can I do? What can the rest of us do? What is another option? And what state are you in? Minnesota. OK. Uh, the options to bail, some of the ones I mentioned, is doing things like, if the point is to get somebody to come back, if they have a cell phone, contact them by cell phone, send them text message reminders. Your court date is in a week. It's in six days. It's in five days. It's in four, right? And so just keeping in contact with somebody, you can, uh, I say a GPS monitoring, I would like to assert, I mean free GPS monitoring because <laughs> the people are usually have to pay for the ankle monitor, the GPS, they have to pay for that. So I would like the state to not incur, put that cost on other people. Um, and then doing things like uh, if there is a, uh, if there are needs, to start addressing the needs right away as opposed to trying to get money right away. And so getting, getting somebody into a program right away, assessment, mental health assessment, or drug or alcohol abuse assessment right away as opposed to anything else, especially for these quality of life crimes, right, with people who don't have homes or outside, or the drug market is outside, or whatever it is, to actually address the obvious needs as opposed to assessing bail. Just to answer kind of maybe two questions, in Washington, D.C., as a, a previous um, uh, person uh, mentioned, there hasn't been uh, money, use, money bail used in about 40 years. Um, so it was one of the first to reform. Um, and the, the system in Washington basically has everyone who's arrested goes before a judge within 24 hours, often less than 12 hours. 92% of those folks are released pretrial. So the vast majority of folks that go before judges in Washington are deemed not to be too dangerous or too, too much of a flight risk, and they're released. 99% of those people come back for court. 99% of those people don't commit a violent offense when they're gone. So it's a very successful system, and it's all the alternatives Karen was mentioning that make it work. There's a very robust pretrial services department in Washington, D.C. So there's going to be phone calls and text message reminders, which is the single most effective way to get people back to court. Because if you put your, if, if you connect up all the dots here and understand how policing works and how arrests and the kinds of communities that are likely to be brought into court, um, there are folks who who aren't going to be fugitives from the law. They're not trying to to to, to right. flee the country. They might have just forgotten the court date. Or in Washington D.C., there's a traffic court, there's a municipal court, there's a county court, there's a federal court. The U.S. Supreme Court is there. <laughs> Probably not showing up that, but you, you know you might you might show up to the wrong courthouse. Some courts are at 9:30, some are at 1:30. The text message reminder actually goes a long way once you understand that people aren't trying to miss court. Mm -hmm. um, there's pretrial supervision, which is literally kind of like a probation officer mm -hmm. that you check in with once or twice a week, uh, who's sort of almost like a caseworker who, who's are you applying for jobs? You know, do you have an apartment? Do you need me to give you listings of apartments to apply for? Whatever it is, they're taking care of your needs and they're almost almost like a caseworker or a probation officer making sure that you're doing the things to get on track and keep your life in order. So these one, are all the alternatives. One really quick fun fact about bail. Clerks have told me and they told me they don't want me to tell other people, but oh well, <laughs> is that they, they in many statutes is the, op is the possibility of giving a high value object as bail. So turning in your watch or your car or your thoroughbred horse and they can't say no, but they also don't really have the capacity to take it. So as a as a litigator, I would be interested in people challenging that and saying, you know, well it's in law, you have to take it and then making the system have to deal with that. And I also just add that uh, most people want to be done with their court case. Very few people would like to prolong it as long as possible, <laughs> right? So poor, rich, black, white, it doesn't matter. Like people want to be done. And then your other question I feel like I didn't address, which is what you can do about it. There is still discretion built in. I've talked to judges who've been on the bench for decades and I've never assessed a fine. So whatever discretion there is, use it to not go to the maximum punishment in terms of money. 
I really love the idea of someone bringing in their horse. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. that, that has to happen. Mm -hmm. um, I went to University of Baltimore where I was in the pretrial justice clinic. So we um, fought against bill, well, for bill reform in Maryland. One of the things, you mentioned the clear and convincing standard of dangerousness. One mm -hmm. of the things that we found is that pretrial services is using the risk assessment tools and citing to prior arrests that resulted in null pros. Mm -hmm. And because people cannot get the, afford to pay to get these expunged off their record, they're now, the judges in district court are now using them as proof of clear and convincing evidence that they are a danger to society and that they should be either held without bail or giving ridiculous high bails. Have you been seeing that in other risk assessment tools in other states? Yeah, no, I think it's very important, and that's why I said you should definitely not use arrests, only prior convictions. Um, but, you know, you're right to point out that even then, and I'm kind of glad you brought up the issue of record sealing and expunction, because this is a major priority for us, and there's a clean slate proposal in Pennsylvania, which uh, we've been working actually with the Center for American Progress on. Um, but uh, that pending legislation in Pennsylvania, which is bipartisan, one of the real steps forward it makes, because we passed a uh, major record sealing law in Texas, and other states have as well, Governor Pence uh, actually even in Indiana. But the Pennsylvania clean slate law, it it's automatic and you don't have to pay um, to hire a lawyer and pay court fees and things. So, you know, making these procedures accessible to everybody, not just those who can afford it, is very important. Um, so, um, but I really think the focus ought to be on do you have a prior violent, very serious conviction in terms of uh, whether, you, you know, you might be in the very small percentage, as you said in D.C., who they find are um, uh, too dangerous to be released pre-trial. I was just curious if, in addition to the litigation and, and legislation, if there was a, a program of outreach to judges, just directly educating and, and advocating for these changes, because it seems like they have a lot of control over, over that. I mean, it's to a certain extent, but judges are all about independence. You know, the California Constitution, it's in there. Like, you cannot in any way, shape, or form mitigate, right, the independence of judges. So there's things like judicial councils where the judges themselves come together and discuss their policies for the court, but nobody can tell a judge what to do. Right for better or for worse, and so I, I'm heartened by there are there, I've seen signs that, that judges and um, judicial counsel and other things have taken up this issue and are kind of self-educating. And I think we started the panel by acknowledging that it, it is in the discourse. There have been convenings at DOJ and the White House, and so it is out there. Um, and I think like the National Center of State Courts, you know, is on the issue. So I there, it's out there. Judges are talking about it, but you can't tell a judge. I just want to quickly add that uh, in Ohio, when the ACLU brought a lawsuit against that, that state, it's judges for illegally jailing people because they were too poor to make a cash payment, um, what they ended up with was a bench card. Now, I'm very critical. I think it's ridiculous, right? But they gave the judges a cheat sheet on the Constitution that they have with them <laughs> at the bench. And this, this is, again, this is something that's lauded as a solution. And I think that's an important step. But, I, but again, just to go tie it back to our plenary panel about how, what are societal norms? To me, this is a perfect example of societal norms. We don't punish people in power. They had hundreds of judges admit that they had violated the Constitution. No one was sanctioned. No one was prosecuted. They gave them more training, and they gave them a bench card, and then touted that as progress. And so ultimately, if we take this seriously, the DOJ would have like an army of lawyers going around the country prosecuting judges and prosecutors for committing these acts. But, but again, we don't punish powerful people in this country, but if my client takes a piss outside because he's got no bathroom to go to, they definitely don't give him a copy of a law and say it's unlawful to urinate in public, right? He goes to jail on that. Mm -hmm. But if a judge does something unlawful, <coughs> we know what happens. Thank you. Um, I have so many questions. Okay, um, mm -hmm. thank you. This has been really um, interesting. I'm curious, I mean, for me personally, I started learning more about bail uh, out, out of Ferguson, and I think that there was a, a much greater public narrative around it, and I feel like it definitely has gained momentum, but I'm curious whether you think um, certain incremental, like, tangential steps would be helpful, or if that would detract from um, the, the push toward abolishing money bail altogether. So for instance, we talked about people who get arrested and then are held, can't afford bail, are held, don't have childcare, lose their job. Like what about some type of protection where you know your job has to be waiting for you? Or like, I, I don't know, so just something along those lines. Like would that 
be helpful? I mean, it would be helpful to that person in the moment, but would it be helpful in the long run or harmful because then it, it drains the momentum from, you know, this thing is so bad and we've got to get rid of it and it's a no-brainer? I think that really highlights the tension between the individual representation and the systemic challenges. It is absolutely true that it's a more powerful narrative to go before a court and say, you have people in this jail who are only here because they can't afford $100, and all these terrible things are happening as a result of that. These, there are consequences to that. And if everyone were out, it would be harder to do that, right? And, and this is not anything I come down on. We, that's why we have direct representation and impact litigation is because we, we believe that the one organically flows from the other, and it's very really important to do. But I, I don't have a great, I don't have a perfect answer for that. Community bail funds yeah, yeah. are a solution to some of these things short term and as part of a, a package. You, if you could go get 100,000 people out of jail right now, that would obviously be better for all of those people who were in jail. I'm not, I, it, may, it might suck the wind out of some of the movement to end cash bail if, if courts perceive that as an end to the problem. I, I don't know, undetermined as of now. Well, and a related thing is that I think the litigation clearly helps provide an impetus for legislation. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that that can very much work in tandem. I would just say that, um, I know I'm not one of the panelists, but I'm jumping in anyway. Um, the work that I do is around media narrative and trying to improve sort of the stories that we're telling in the news, both local and nationals, to reflect the kind of work that's being done on the ground and in the courts. Um, and part and 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 that is where a lot of the responsibility comes in to be able to identify when changes are made to also say this is only a part of the bigger changes that need to be made that gets lost a lot um, when new legislation is passed or new regulations are passed and what you read is this is a solution not this is not even a solution a band aid maybe on a much much bigger problem because when you talk to people who work for bail funds they say that one day we hope we're irrelevant you know we don't want to be doing we don't want to be bailing people out we want to be ending bail okay, community bail funds not bail <laughs> not the other kind of bail funds but um you don't it's not translated into the way that we always tell the story on a bigger level yeah if i can jump in on on that question it's just to think about because equal to center law is a purely impact litigation group and we have a, we also try to do a lot of um, advocacy and media work but not so much legislation although sometimes our litigation for legislation. Um, so I think a lot about sort of how is the change going to happen if it happens. And I'm more and more coming to feel that sort of the short term, it, it has no predictable outcome on the long term. Legislation, litigation, great journalism, what really matters at the end of the day is how people feel, literally feel, um, emotionally. Sad. I'm, not, I'm not so glad about this actually, but it seems to be how our culture works. Uh, Mark was telling me before the panel that the Texas Constitution already has a pro prohibition against jailing people for being on the middle of the court bed. The Supreme Court has a landmark case that's over 30 years old saying it violates the 14th Amendment to jail people who can't pay their court debts. And yet Texas has had to pass legislation to address the same issue again. It almost doesn't matter whether you have a good law on the books or a good Supreme Court precedent if people don't care, if people aren't continuing to pay attention. So. I guess I'm, I'm starting to lean to answer this question that was asked is, is anything we can do, and I don't have the answer actually, to get people caring about the inequality in our justice system and refusing to stand for it, refusing to accept it. And it's in a world where there are so many things we have to be vigilant about, the environmental degradation, the, I mean, I don't even want to start the list actually, because there's so many, there's so much that's asked of us to continually vigilantly care about, but I think that's pretty much what we have to do. And so whether you're motivated by this awesome court victory or this awesome piece of legislation or just community organizing or media work or whatever it is, we gotta find a way to keep people engaged however it is, you know, stories about folks who are, who are, who are um, harmed by the system, and that's gotta stick because it's very easy to imagine in 40 years all of the great litigation victories and all of the great uh, things that are happening in legislatures just kind of dying in the back of the library. Yeah, well, I mean, and a lot of these people are elected. I mean, like the sheriff in Harris County who recently was elected, he's compl started complying virtually immediately with the court ruling, even though, you know, 15 judges are continuing to oppose it. And I'm also, you know, another example was in San Antonio, the uh, juvenile probation and juvenile detention said to the schools, we're not taking for truancy anymore. Um, so 
you know, courageous sheriffs and so forth, when someone's being unconstitutionally jailed, maybe they need to tell the court, look, I can't jail this person unconstitutionally anymore. I wanted to go back to something you brought up, Mark, um, about expungement. So I worked in an expungement clinic, and time and time again, I would see folks who were otherwise eligible, but who had these fines and fees that they couldn't pay, they couldn't fulfill their sentence, they couldn't get expunged, which led to a whole host of other collateral consequences, housing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, in, I'm from Portland, Oregon. We know that the state is sitting on about $2 billion worth of this debt. And so, Karen, I'm, I'm curious, you brought this up in the beginning. Um, the cost of collecting on that debt, is it worth it? And what do we do about wiping it um, or otherwise dealing with it? Right. Uh, I don't know. But the, the, I mean, there's hundreds of billions of dollars in unpaid court order debt right now. If you look at the federal level and the state level, like Iowa has gone from something like $300 million in debt um, 10 years ago or something to now about $700 million of unpaid court debt in Iowa. Iowa's not a very big state. Um, California, I think, it has $10 billion in unpaid court debt. So some of it is simple accounting that there needs to be a reality check about some of this debt is not collectible. So instead of continuing to devote resources to trying to collect and punish people, let it go. Like, just let it go. Let, put it in the ether, let it go, and move on. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's something to be said for just actually pressing on that point of just reality, and you know, it's a it's a accounting issue. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the issue of cost is is, is really massive because there is a serious infrastructure at this point to try to collect court ordered debt. I mean, if you think about everything in the actual physical courthouse, but also probation, which does a lot of the actual collecting in this country, and then of course the jails where people end up, and of course the attorneys who are involved. I mean, it's a really massive infrastructure. Um, trying to get a number on what that is is quite difficult, but I think it starts in a, in a municipality. So taking Portland, Oregon, and trying to actually sit down and say we have this number of court, with this number of staff, with this number of judges, and actually map out the process as you know it, mm -hmm. like how people actually go from A to B and seeing what they touch and what touches them, and trying to put numbers would be a really useful thing to do. Well, and there's plenty of researchers who would like to help you. So. In Texas, there's contractors also to the driver responsibility program, which millions of people yeah. to, to keep their license, they have to pay thousands of dollars a year if they've had several speeding or one DWI, but there's various contractors who have millions of dollars in contracts to collect on that program as well as a failure to appear program. So if you have a few different traffic citations on one ticket, it's $500 like for each failure to appear. So that adds up and then there's a company, you know, Omnibase or whatever, and they come up and lobby of course against bills to reform it. Um, but they're making millions of dollars to con collect on that. So that's, uh, we're actually working with the Brennan Center to try to uh, uh, really uh, calculate all the amount of money being spent on these collections activities. So um, I wanted to ask a question about a theme several of you have talked about, which is um, really that there's this premise in the bail system that's common throughout the criminal legal system, which is that um, there's an amount of state violence and control that's appropriate for poor and black neighborhoods and not for anyone else. And I, you've spoken a lot about this challenge of if you use risk assessments, if you replace bond, is that just pushing for a more efficient way of controlling those neighborhoods and those people? Or are you actually able to disrupt that premise? And it seems like an area in which it's very contested and social movements are really important in changing beliefs and narratives. And I know that's a whole big conversation, but I wondered if there was one or two things you think that as lawyers we should be doing to support those social movements and to prevent all of the actors who made the bail system from re-entrenching in whatever its next iteration is? Well, mm -hmm. just my real yeah. quick two cents on that is if you believe that there is a problem, uh, as opposed to doing what might seem intuitive, which is becoming a t defense attorney, go into prosecution, because prosecutors have so much power, and the power is really becoming more and more concentrated. So if you have reform ideas, or if you believe that we should be thinking about the front door, the entry to the criminal justice system, then go there, right? Because that's who's controlling a lot of the front door. Um, I, I think this is primarily for Karen, but if any of the others want to answer it, I'd welcome it. I'd like to hear more about your thoughts on day fining. Oh, I have so many thoughts. That's a dangerous <laughs> question. <laughs> um, 
my thoughts are, so we tried it in this country in the 80s and 90s. The Vera Institute for Justice did some demonstration projects with Staten Island in Maricopa County, Arizona, actually. Um, they tried in Ventura County, California, came very close and then failed. Interestingly enough, because the judge, a new judge came into town and was like, I don't want to do this, which just spoke to the power of judges and the, the role of discretion and trying to take people's discretion away. So I, I have lots of thoughts, but my main thought is that we are very much at the point where we need to start trying this again in this country. And what it takes is for somebody at, in the hierarchical structure of criminal justice system, somebody who is a, a chief judge, chief probation officer, um, somebody in that level to decide that they're interested in partnering with a researcher. Because we need to demonstrate that it works and so we can then convince other people that it works. I, I, even though we've already kind of done that and all of Europe's already doing it, we need to try it in the US. Um, what I think is at stake is both fairness and efficiency because it is more fair to tailor the punishment to the person, but it also does address that cost side of the equation. It's cheaper for the state to have a punishment that actually can be finalized. We, you know, we have finality as an underlying tenet of punishment in this country. It actually can be completed, and so the state is not engaging in an endless relationship with somebody over debt. So I, you know, I hope that uh, expands my thoughts a little bit more. I'm happy to say. More. And can I just add one of the things we didn't have time to discuss, but is police diversion because that actually solves the whole thing because you never get taken to jail. There's never bail. There's never fines or fees. Mm -hmm. But you know, you for the Seattle Lead program is a great example. Mm -hmm. But you know, basically, it's you're referred to a case manager, and they have temporary supportive housing. A lot of the clients are homeless and so forth. But I'd encourage you to take a look at that because that actually circumvents all these problems. I, I was actually still thinking about the previous question. Yeah, I was before, actually gonna uh, before I had a, a chance to weigh in, so I want to turn back to that, which is sort of what can be done or, or what's gonna. I was gonna ask that actually of everybody. I think that's a good yeah. last question. Yeah, it's a great, so. it's a great last question. So. Um, uh, actually, first out of curiosity, how many people are currently either currently in law school or within two years of having been in law school? Um, so I was just trying to get a sense of the audience. So um, uh, it looks like including the, the gentleman who asked the question. So I think as lawyers, um, you're in a special position, and I liked hearing what Karen said about you know considering prosecution, which I personally would never do, but it's worth um, it's worth considering. Um, I'll just caution that. Although prosecution as an entity has a lot of power, and I worked at the Department of Justice as a, as a civil rights a plaintiff's lawyer, not as a prosecutor. Um, so yes, prosecutors as an entity have a lot of power, but signing up to be an individual prosecutor, you will likely have very little power, mm -hmm. and all of the influences of the system are likely to take you over, because you'll have a supervisor, who will have a supervisor, who will have a supervisor, a very bureaucratic entity, and there's a chain of command, and your ability to actually influence things will cut against your own self-interest of keeping the job, of getting a promotion, of being liked by your supervisor. So just be cautious if you're doing that, that, that you know, there's a chain of command you'll be joining. Um, I think another option is well, what I've decided to do, um, which was leave the government and become a real civil rights lawyer. Um, <laughs> not, not to disparage the DOJ, but it's, it's an inherently conservative entity and, and it's hard to really change the system, from, in, in my opinion, uh, from inside. Um, Equal Justice Center Law is a nonprofit, but I do tell a lot of uh, recent law grads and current law students that the kind of work that we do can similarly be done. It's, it's, it is a risk. You know, I took a huge pay cut when I left the Department of Justice. Um, it is a risk, but a similar model can actually be done. I'd be happy to talk with folks about kind of what I personally experienced in, in sort of starting something. Um, that's another route, but to really to just to identify problems and be aggressive about it. Um, I was on a panel earlier this week at, at a different uh, conference. One of the panelists was saying, you know, basically, don't take too many risks because you can really create bad law. And I found myself sort of feeling the opposite. Um, I agree with that. Bad law definitely can and, and is created. But I almost feel like I want more lawyers, not just young lawyers, but across the board lawyers taking risks, sort of pushing the envelope, raising these issues. I do worry about bad law, um, but I much more worry about the what I was talking about earlier, which is the broad continuing social movement and sort of the public awareness and having conversations with your friends and relatives and classmates and colleagues and keeping that going, keeping awareness on issues, identifying deeper issues to answer one of the direct questions. I actually don't, even though it's a lot of equal justice work, I don't think bail reform is going to fix the criminal justice system. I think it's a very, very, very small part. I love doing the work, but I think it's a tiny piece of the puzzle because you got to go back further and further into why policing is the way it is, why crimes are, like how we define what's a crime, all the stuff we've been talking about, which, which the bail work that we do isn't even touching. Um, so I, I think 
the more focus that can be given to the more issues is what I would say. And one way to do that is by sort of going out on your own, trying to identify civil rights violations and, and filing lawsuits. Can, can I just... Um can I just jump on what you were saying about prosecutors since we're talking about them and it's my favorite subject of conversation. Um, I am a lawyer who never practiced law a single day in my life and one thing I've learned is that I, I follow prosecutors nationwide. I did it as journalist, I do it as a policy person now, half-time journalist. Um, and what I have really realized is that there's a high return on investment in, in holding people accountable on, on that level, especially elected prosecutors. It's not necessarily the same with elected judges. It gets really messy when you look at a lot of other people in the system. But for a very entrenched system, with the, which the criminal justice system is, it's generally very hard to make big changes in the system. Um, it has proven not as difficult to push elected prosecutors either to, um, to, to defeat them. I mean, we defeated last year. I mean, it was a horrible year for for us in the November election pretty generally, and we won like 13 out of the 16 prosecutor races that we invested in, and that wasn't a ton of investment. There are a lot of people who are doing bad things, either unconstitutional or just, or just immoral, because they are not being held accountable, because nobody knows who they're voting for, nobody knows what they're voting for, nobody knows what happens in court, like Karen was saying, nobody goes, nobody has looked at the numbers, because maybe there aren't numbers. Just you don't have to be a lawyer necessarily to hold people accountable in the way, in the electoral process or in the policy process. Um, and so I would encourage people to know what, especially what their prosecutor is doing. It's hard to know what your prosecutor is doing. To spoiler alert, you can't really know what your prosecutor is doing. <laughs> but know as much as what you can about what your prosecutor is doing. Do you want to go, Mark? Oh, well, I mean, it's interesting that um, I'm actually going to be on a panel in a week or so here on uh, the rise in rural jails. But the Vera Institute's done some very interesting work, which shows that in the urban areas, incarceration, both pretrial and, and, and post trial, has been going down over the last five years. But actually, it's continuing to go up in rural areas and small cities. And uh, they profiled, in particular, the county where Scranton, Pennsylvania is. And if you look at, they plotted their incarceration rate in New York City and going completely different directions. They're now a few times uh, higher than New York City. Um, so this does, one of the reasons I think that incarceration incarceration has been going down from the urban areas is the types of people, you know, you have the new DA in Chicago, for example. So there are people running on platforms of, uh, you know, alternatives to incarceration. Um, so uh, I, I very much see a lot of hope there uh, in terms of, I mean, you can argue like in Germany, which I referenced before, they don't even elect judges or prosecutors and it's viewed this should be completely non-political, uh, these types of decisions, and they have a tenth of the incarceration rate that we do. But given that we are uh, electing people, um, uh, what you said certainly makes sense and we're seeing that I think one of the reasons I mean there's the opioid epidemic there's other reasons why rural incarceration is going up but I think political attitudes of the jurisdiction do play a major role and Thomas do you want to give sure I, I would say uh, um, about what you can do and this is going to sound a little bit strange but since you're all lawyers and law students but ignore most of what law school teaches you mm -hmm. yeah. and focus on I think you have a better sense you probably all had a better sense of what justice was before you came to law school than you may now. And, and in fact, maybe the, the, the intent of law school is to erode your sense of what justice is so you can go work at a large law firm and make someone millions and millions of dollars while you're paid six figures and you assuage yourself through the performance of 50 hours of pro bono work a year, which will never offset the massive damage you do to society <laughs> as you work for those law firms. So, like, Forget about what the majority of what law school has to say and take advantage of great professors who care about social and racial justice and forge alliances with your wealthy, powerful classmates so that you can ask them to make donations to yourself or your law firm or your nonprofit when you go out and do that work on your own. You can do an immense amount of work. And I am, you know, I always say this, you have to, you have, to have a, enough self-awareness to know that of what you can't do when you get out of law school. But I find people, and I, oddly, especially people at elite legal institutions, to be racked with self-doubt and, and a lack of confidence about what they can do when they walk out of law school and they believe they need training and they need this in-depth training before they ever help someone. And I, don't, I think there's a degree to which that's true, obviously, but for the most part, you can go help poor people 
people in jails, people at homeless shelters, simply by virtue of offering to help them and collaborating with local lawyers who know more than you do. And I don't think that should ever be a barrier to um, beginning to help immediately after graduation uh, from law school. Well, I should just make a pitch for those of you that don't want to practice law, the state-based think tank route uh, in particular. Um, I kind of see think tanks at the intermediary between academia. We put some of the research findings in a language uh, lawmakers can understand, uh, low reading level perhaps, low attention span. <laughs> but um, no, the uh, and then at the state level in particular, unlike Washington, I mean, I go with the Texas legislature. We have a bill later up that day. I can fill out cards of legislators I know. The, you know, uh, the clerk goes in and uh, gives them my card and they come out and I can talk to a number of them before they vote and say, you know, here's what our research says uh, about why we should, you know, reduce incarceration or whatever it is. So, uh, and obviously the papers we publish and so forth are really linked to what, how can those help drive reforms in the upcoming legislative session? So uh, I would definitely encourage you, whether it's a liberal or conservative think tank, particularly at the state level, I believe you could have a tremendous impact. All right, on that note, we are done. Thank you guys so much. Thank you.